around a thousand years ago, lived a very famous polymath by the name of Abu Bakr al-Razi in Baghdad. He is considered to be one of the most important figures in the history of medicine. He was tasked to build the biggest hospital at the time and find a suitable location. To pick the future's hospital location, al-Razi hung raw pieces of meat all over the city and decided to build the hospital where the meat remained the freshest. He used technology in its most basic form to answer a key question on environmental health. This is the very definition of the word technology. It is to apply scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Fast forward to the 21st century. I grew up in Cairo, a city that shows all the typical traits of an emerging economy when it comes to air quality and health. I was raised in a household of doctors that spent their lifetime researching the complex sensitivities between the air we breathe and our health. I grew up understanding that air pollution is more than just capturing data. It is about reduced life quality, high health care costs, and slower healing. It is also about acute asthmatic episodes where you're driving around the city looking for remedies, asking yourself when and where the triggers might have occurred. Studies have shown that avoiding triggers such as particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide pollution can actually reduce hospitalization rates and clinical visits for asthmatics by up to 40%. As I speak now, nine out of 10 people on the planet breathe poor air quality, which is directly connected to severe clinical manifestations such as asthma, diabetes, and cancer. And just today, a researcher team in London found the smoking gun when it comes to how healthy cells become cancerous cells. And it is air pollution. So I'm very curious to see how that unfolds in the future. Particulate matter pollution accounts for 23% of all heart disease-related death and 21% of all stroke death. And pollutants, such as tropospheric ozone, also contribute to the climate crisis and even crop yield losses. All these challenges are tied to the very air that you and I breathe. Today, we have tools to monitor air quality, but they are far from enough because they are not there when and where we need them most. Today, air quality is monitored using complex stations, instruments, inconspicuous from the outside, technical miracles on the inside, they can actually weigh the air that we breathe up to the fifth digit after the comma. But they're also very expensive and very bulky. More than 100 countries do not own a single air quality monitoring station, leaving a billion people in so-called air pollution blind spots. And those cities that do own such stations barely have any coverage. Take the city of Munich as an example. It has 1.5 million inhabitants, and it only has three monitoring stations in the inner city area. These stations were designed in the 1950s and 60s, and while the world has changed dramatically over the past decades, the concept behind today, today's air quality management programs has not. While in the 1960s, 50s, there were three megacities, today there are 33. And while in the 1950s, 30% of the population lived in cities, today it's 50%. And by 2050, more people will be living in cities than there are people on the planet today. And it's not just about the embarrassingly low number of data points, but also air quality data is not used to its fullest potential. As if we're still caught in the 1950s, Cities do not use the captured air quality data to correlate it with traffic or health or other social economic data, population density, disease incidences, to understand the health burden of air pollution and mitigate the effects of the bad air that you and I breathe. Cities only use the stations for threshold monitoring only, meaning that only if thresholds are exceeded, governments are forced to act. But what does that mean in practical terms? What incentive does the system create? Well, in the city of Munich, one station has been, has been causing problems for years, exceeding thresholds. 
So what did the city do? Well, they installed air filters right around the monitoring station. I think it makes absolute sense if you're living right next to it, or maybe in clear terms, on top of the station. But what about the millions who do not? Other cities built their station high on rooftops or let traffic detour around the stations to avoid registering threshold exceedances. This is a billion dollar industry that has lost track of the why. But the good news is it doesn't always, it's not going to continue like that anymore. For the first time in 15 years, the World Health Organization has drastically reduced what is deemed as clean air, prompting governments worldwide to follow suit. Examples are Ella's law in the UK or the EU, which will be um, publishing new guidelines this year. Let's take a white sheet of paper and design a new system that seamlessly integrates air quality data in matters of public health, transportation, freight and logistics management, city planning, and energy. How do we design a system that is scalable, accurate, and traceable to the accepted standards? How do we design a solution that is adaptable to varying degrees of, of, of descending degrees of variability? Global, regional, hyperlocal, historic, real-time, forecasted. How do we design a system that puts human, human needs at its core for healthy air, clean mobility, and sustainable development? A system fit for the 21st century. Well, we already have all the ingredients we need to build such a system. We just need to consolidate it and place it all together in a meaningful and practical approach. And this is exactly what my team and myself have set out to do. Major advancements in sensor technologies have allowed us to create smaller sensors that are accurate, digital, and easily mountable. These sensors can be installed on light poles, um, advertising boards, bus stops, postal boxes, buildings, making capturing air quality data ubiquitous. We can actually teach those sensors to turn the mechanical challenges in monitoring air quality, such as weather and pollutant cross sensitivities, into mathematical problems and transfer the learnings of these problems to all other sensors in the, in the field. So instead of an individualistic hardware driven approach, our sensors are like a swarm of data collectors, ever communicating, ever learning. And we don't just stop there. By using cutting edge, satellite technologies, we're able to create spatial models, so basically predicting for every point on the planet how air quality is, even if though there are no sensors installed. And using machine learning, we can also create forecasts hour by the hour. So for the first time, the application of air quality data is not bound by the limitations of the technology, but by the very practical purpose it needs to serve. In the city of Munich, we recruited 1,600 commuters. And together with our partners, we provided forecast-adjusted routes for these commuters. We wanted to see whether we can change the behavior of these commuters towards a more sustainable mobility behavior. It turns out from the 1,600 drivers, 40% repeatedly chose the forecasted route. So we can actually change the behavior if the data is provided in an easy, practical, and timely manner. Now, there are 48 million cars in Germany. Can you imagine the impact if such a, a solution was made to scale? But let's take it even further. Let's talk about environmental health. What if we cross-reference this approach with data on public health, on disease incidences, or the use of medication for asthmatics, for example, on income levels, on employment rates? We can actually use to solve, uh, this tool to solve environmental injustice. Cities could use this new level of data in order to make sure that everybody is treated equally when it comes to environmental health, regardless of color, income, background, origin, or employment rate. Environmental justice becomes tangible, visible, and injustice solvable. How is the air quality in all playgrounds? How is the air quality in our schools, in our hospitals, in our daycare centers? in every place we, we spent our daily lives. We never had the chance to pose these questions because we never had the means to answer them. 
But let's think even, think even bigger. What if for any given time and location, I could give you the exact amount of emissions and pollutants being created? Every airport, every harbor, every city, every mining facility, all of these regions, we can quantify what is being polluted. So we can actually track our measured improvements instead of simply calculating them. Imagine if we underlying this data with the volume or value of goods served, with the amount of people moved or the energy consumed. So instead of the global broken carbon accounting system, you get a, a system for regulating our economic, ecological, and social activities that is directly tied to the atmosphere, to the very air, air that we breathe. We take 300 million breaths in our lifetime. 300 million, what a number. And we're not the only ones to do that. Animals, plants, even our oceans breathe from the same atmosphere. So why does it feel so remote talking about air quality? Why is the topic of air quality on the fringes and niche heavily underfunded? There is a saying in Arabic that says, time is like a sword. If you don't cut it, it cuts you. And in air pollution and in climate crisis, time is of the essence. So I hereby call on all the decision makers to let go of the old methods of old and, and let innovation find its way. And for everybody else of the listeners to join our cause and really help us build the system that is really directly tied to the very air that we breathe on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Thank you.